So we're here at Postback, we're backstage actually, and people are on stage right now. Who are you? Uh, I'm Rich Wong, I'm a partner at Excel Partners. We're a venture capital firm down in Palo Alto. Very proud uh, investors in Tune. Excellent. Obviously we're all about mobile. This conference is all about mobile. Uh, but mobile's changing. Uh, what are the things you see that are changing the most about mobile right now? So I think, you know, uh, as much as we think of this as historically mostly a uh, U.S. and Western European phenomena, you really have seen um, the rise of smartphones on a global basis. And so you're starting to see the third world markets, international markets like India in particular and Brazil develop in a way that's far more important than it was just a few years ago. So I think one of the most obvious things is the international nature of mobile, yes. more so than just a few years ago. Yes. And so as we have mobile, and mobile's getting more and more important, um, we also have the rise of things like bots and chat bots on messaging platforms and everything. What role do you think those will play and wh where do they play in the connection between a company and its customers? Right, right. So, so I think you know, every uh, few years there's a mixture of uh, of uh, appropriate trends and sometimes hype that rolls through the industry. Obviously mobile apps was one of those trends and right now the idea of messaging and chatbots as a way of transacting all of your mobile experiences is an idea that's in vogue right now. Yes. As usual, the reality of the matter is that you always want a multi-channel way to reach your consumer. So the AI-driven chatbot is not going to dominate everything by, by any means or even anywhere close to dominating everything. I think it's going to be a really important interaction for some set of users mm -hmm. and for some set of use cases. So for example, customer support, yes. uh, I think it would make a lot of sense. You say, I want to reschedule flight. Uh, the AI bot can understand it. It certainly can understand your location. It's maybe even more efficient than a human in doing things like that. Yes. But for general unbounded things where the machine doesn't know in advance the context, you know, the technology isn't really there yet to handle conversation in that unbounded way. And frankly, in a lot of cases, apps or other types of modalities may end up being an easier way to do it. So it's not an either or, even though it's sort of easy to talk about it that way, perhaps in, in the media. The other thing that's really, really interesting is, is a little bit related because, of course, it can be AI driven and natural language driven and everything like that. But we see the rise, we think we're going to see the rise of things like Siri, Alexa, Cortana, right. Vive.ai, Hey Google, those sorts of things that'll help us to do multiple things uh, easily, quickly, but just telling them what we want done. Right. What do you think is the, the horizon? What's the time frame at which we'll start seeing those things? really be usable to book me a flight, book me a hotel, uh, get a, get a, get tickets for the game and, right. and know some of my preferences for price and, and all that stuff. When do you think is the time frame for some of that stuff to be real? Uh, I think some of that uh, is real now. You know, I think some of the AI or ML driven services does exist in fact today and over the next 69 months will get substantially better. And so I think, um, despite my earlier comments about you know, there being some level of hype around AI and chatbots, yes. uh, that doesn't mean that there won't be excellent use cases and excellent things that make sense as economic models and as businesses, even starting now. Yes. Uh, my earlier comment of some of the hype around the space is that it just can't do everything. It will not be the only or primary, in my opinion, right. interface to services that right. is sometimes talked about. Right. And is it only the big companies, the Googles, the Apples, the Amazons um, that can really compete in that space or, or can startups actually do that as well? Yes, it's an interesting question about whether or not this is a rich get richer, the incumbents that own a ton of data, be it a Facebook or a Google, are the ones that ultimately uh, have enough data to actually make uh, successful ML or AI predictions. Yes. Um, I don't have a great answer for you because I don't know, I obviously as a venture capitalist hope for the startup world yes. to be able to continue to disrupt the incumbents. Yes. And I think it's really a battle of two different secular forces in the market right now. So as many of us know, you have this concept of the rise of APIs, mm -hmm. but the general mm -hmm. idea that data is more accessible and open than ever before as people are building software systems these days. Yes. But at the same time, you have the, the rise of incumbents that have massive three to $400 billion market cap companies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that have massive market power, like the Googles and the Facebooks of the world. And they, of course, want to take some substantial advantage yes. from their data. Yeah. And so that battle of you know verticalization of data versus the openness through APIs is one of those battles that I do not know the answer of how it's going to play out. I certainly 
vote and hope for the openness. Yes. But we'll see how we'll have to see how that plays out over the next few years. And that's a really interesting question, right? Because uh, let's assume that a Facebook wins. I mean, no co one company is going to win everything, right? There'll be multiple. But right now, if you want to get to market, you want to get to your customers. Uh, maybe an app is the best answer, and you get a one-to-one -one relationship there. But let's say a future uh, Facebook M or Siri 3.0 or Alexa 4.0, whatever the case might be. How do you get on that system? How do you get on that platform as a company that wants to connect with your customers? What is the algorithm there? Is it obscure? Is it opaque? Who, who creates that and who owns that? That's an interesting question. Well, I, I think hopefully we can take uh, some inspiration and uh, we'll credit where credit's due to Google in terms of how they essentially gave a gift to the industry around Android where there was many of the concerns when Android was first acquired by Google, what, 11 years ago, I believe, yes. that um, you know, they would bend it to their own uh, services benefit. Mm -hmm. And obviously, mm -hmm. they're a for-profit capitalistic business, and at some point, it does have to pay off for them. Yeah. But to their credit, I think they really managed Android as a pretty much horizontal platform for the benefit of anybody that wanted to innovate on it and not really giving too much advantage to Google services yes. in the majority yes. of the early years. Yes. And so, um, and I think that allowed Android to become essentially dominant or mm -hmm. at least the other dominant player other than Apple. Yep. And that ultimately plays to Google's long-term benefit. So my hope in these new platforms, whether it's these AI, ML, assistant-driven, perhaps chat-driven environments, we'll also learn from that positive lesson and create a more horizontal open system. Um, maybe that's too Pollyannish, but I do believe that uh, it's really very much benefited Google strategically to have taken you know, that approach. Rich, thank you so much for taking a few minutes here with me. John, it's always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. <laughs>